Ready? I'm ready. <laughs> uh, so it's been a long time coming, uh, finally here, and I'm excited to share with you ultrasound imaging diagnostics of the internal anatomy and reproductive organs of in adult nylotilapia oreochromis niloticus. So in this thesis, it's broken up into two studies. Um, there's going to be a lot of information and it's a lot of new information for some. Um, so I just have the outline real quick here, starting with an introduction. So some brief uh, global production of nylotilapia, some reproductive biology of tilapia and the issues associated with the reproductive uh, biology of tilapia. We go into ultrasonography, the history, the background, and basic ultrasound principles, which will assist us to go through um, the development of fish handling and ultrasound imaging procedures, which make up the first study. Followed by the second study, um, ultrasound imaging of the ovarian development, and then, of course, a conclusion and acknowledgement. Okay, so the Nile tilapia, as we are a little familiar with, um, our second most farmed fish in global thin fish inland production, followed by carp. Their production continues to increase. In 1980, it stood at 41,000 tons, and by 2020, it reached 4.5 million tons. It's expected to reach 41,000 million tons by 2030. So clearly, tilapia has made an impact and continues to be an important food fish. So it's important that we continuously study the reproductive biology of these fish because the food fish start somewhere, right? They start with our breeders and they start as an egg. So looking into tilapia reproduction, tilapia are prolific breeders. That means they have the ability to spawn in consecutive intervals. Each ovarian cycle runs from 14 to 18 days and has been even shown to reach 21 days. So theoretically, prolific breeding should lead to continuously amount of fry. However, tilapia are also asynchronous. So this means that their ovaries have different developmental stages. And this hinders synchronization, which hinders broodstock from spawning at the same time. This results in reproductive competition between the males and the females and leads to episodic fry, which episodic fry are fry of various sizes and wide ranges. So with that thinking, you know, different sizes leads to cannibalistic and aggressive behavior, which has resulted in 10 to 35% of fry loss within the 50 days of rearing. So the ways to assess that is to look into the methods for assessing the reproductive conditions in tilapia. So the current methods are physically invasive methods and non-invasive methods. Physically invasive methods consist of ovarian biopsy. So this is inserting a catheter or tubing with a syringe into the ovipore. Um, there have been concerns in the publication stating that this may cause abrasion to the surrounding organs and may even affect the potential uh, for future reproduction. So there is been um, concern in the research that re more research needs to be done to, to see if ovarian biopsy um, really is uh, causing a lot more stress. Another option is histology. This has been a well-known technique and been really reliable. Um, however, it does require euthanizing the fish. It's also time consuming and expensive, uh, which may not be feasible for certain farmers. And even when resources are available, this may not always be feasible. So the non-invasive method, methods are limited. Um, these consist of the use of ultrasonography. There's only one current publication that has conducted ultrasound imaging on tilapia, but they used it as a sex identification tool. This publication also lacks reporting of control settings and developed fish handling procedures, but ultrasonography has been conducted on various fish species. So since 1980, the use of ultrasonography has been done on as small as a zebra fish to as large as a whale shark to your commercially important fish species, such as the sturgeon, your channel catfish, your hybrid side bass, um, and your salmonids. So all these species have been conducted and there's been over 97 publications and over 60 species. So ultrasonography has played big contributions in aquaculture and fisheries. 
It's used as a sex identification tool. Um, it's used to assess the reproductive conditions, so fecundity, ovarian diameter, oocyte diameter, and has also been shown to assess uh, fish fillet quality. And this has been seen in channel catfish as well as uh, fat composition in mirror carp. Furthermore, it's also beneficial for threatened and endangered species because it is a non-invasive technique and you're able to access, uh, readily access um, data real easily uh, with this technology. <laughs> so some examples, we've got a sturgeon. This is use of ultrasonography is really popular with sturgeon because sturgeon don't have the sexual dimorphic characteristics. And so this tool has been used uh, for many years as a sex identification tool with sturgeon and has also been used as a way to determine the point in which the caviar um, can be taken and is optimal. Another example is channel catfish. This study specifically looked at ovulation. So they used uh, ultrasound images as a way to determine the point in which the fish was ready to ovulate therefore being able to reject the fish instead of wasting hormones on fish that aren't ready, they were able to use ultrasound as an assistive way to uh, do that in a better manage of practices. Another example is salmon. There's a lot of, a lot of salmonids have been conducted with the use of ultrasonography to find optimal periods of spawning. This study specifically compared ultrasound images and histology images. So there's variety of species and it's been used for many years. However, there is a problem and a review done on the use of ultrasonography and fish reproduction by Novello and Tiersch 2012 found that 89 of these studies don't report control settings. And that's a big, that's a big portion and that's a factor towards replicating research and conducting examinations on, spin, on fish. And there's a variety of control settings that we consider. So your primary control settings are frequency, depth, focus, and gain. The secondary control settings are near gain and far gain. So we're gonna look into further the control settings. It's gonna be a lot of information, um, but it will help to understand the ultrasound image and interpretation. So your primary control setting, so frequency, frequency is the number of sound waves emitted per second in megahertz. So this is what's being uh, emitted from your probe. Depth is the distance field of view and the depth of ultrasound penetration. It's typically in centimeters or millimeters, and there's typically increment, little tick marks on each side. Um, they're hard to see in this image, um, but they're usually on the left-hand side. Focus will increase the resolution of specific areas. So this, the focus is typically represented as a little triangle on the left hand side of an image. And gain will increase the overall brightness of the field of view. Gain's broken down into near gain and far gain, with near gain being the area um, closest to the probe, and it's the ability to lighten and darken those areas closest to the probe, rather than far gain, is lightening and darkening the areas that are farther from the probe um, to the target area. So you can see there's a variety of different control settings, and these are things that you want to consider. The publication review by Novello and Church 2012 also found that there is a variability in the handling procedure. And this becomes a problem when you start to think of the different species, right? Every species, you know, the different types of species, the surgeon from a zebrafish is very different and the size is very different. Uh, the morphology of the fish, the internal anatomy and external anatomy of a fish can be variable within the species. Ultrasound equipment, there's also a variation. So you got different types of probes from a linear probe, a curved probe and a phased array probe. And then there's even more variety in the machines. So how do we approach the use of ultrasonography in fish? Well, it's done by developing replicable procedures for the use of this. And there's two main components. So the first component is through fish handling procedures. This consists of fish position. So how are you holding the fish? 
then probe placement. So where on the body of the fish are you placing the probe? Handling system, is the fish being removed from its holding tank? Is it being examined directly in the holding tank or is it being placed into another separate holding tank? And then the use of anesthetics or not, whether that is needed um, to reduce stress or whether there, um, there is no need to use anesthetics and you can just do a quick examination. The second component is ultrasound imaging procedures. So having a basic understanding of basic um, ultrasound principles, which we will go over, uh, probe position, which is, which is different from your probe placement, but probe position is, is your probing place on a certain plan. Is that plane? Is that transverse plane? Is that a longitudinal plane or is that a sagittal plane? And then the control settings is having some idea of um, your control settings, which will lead to proper interpretation when all of these things are considered. <laughs> So interpretation of an ultrasound image consists of knowing your fish, right? So knowing the internal anatomy of the fish, knowing the morphology externally as well, and understanding the probe placement with adjacent internal anatomy. The third factor is the ultrasound machine, your manual. That is that is the heart of everything. You, you know, as big and thick as it may seem, it is um, what will guide you to understanding the machine better, to understanding what appears on the interface. Um, and then understanding your basic ultrasound principles in, in relationship with the tissue composition that generates um, the relation to the echogenesis, which we will go further into some background on echogenesity. So echogenesity is the ability to reflect and transmit ultrasound waves within the center of a surrounding tissue. So tissue is re reflected through echogenesity and is described through this term. So with bone, bone is referred to as hyperechoic. This means that it appears white. And so the denser the substance is, the more the sound waves will be reflected back to the probe, thus the brighter the image will appear on the screen. With tissues, this is referred to as hyper or hypoechoic. And this appears in ranges of gray, depending on the density of the tissue. So if the tissue is much more denser, it'll appear brighter on the screen, rather a softer tissue will appear darker and in the darker shades of gray. So the sound rays typically for tissues reflect um, homogeneous on the ultrasound image. For fluid, fluid is referred to as having an echogenesity of anechoic. So this means it appears black. And this is because with fluid, fluid ultrasound waves just travel through it. There's no resistance, there's no bouncing back, there's no echo, there's no reflection. So therefore, it will appear black on the machine. Okay, good. <laughs> so we just had some ultrasound, basic ultrasound principles. I hope you all are supposed, you know, able to absorb some of that. So now we can go further into study one, which is the development of fish handling and ultrasound imaging procedures for Nile tilapia. So the purpose of the study was to develop a systematic framework that allows experienced and unexperienced users to approach the use of ultrasound in fish. It can be made universally um, to be approached not only with tilapia, with, with other fish species. The goal of our study was to develop a systematic fish handling ultrasound framework for viewing the internal anatomy and reproductive organs in tilapia. So the first objective, assess fish handling and probe position procedures, evaluate primary control settings, frequency, depth, and focus at all uh, landmarks, and then utilize these developed ultrasound and fish handling procedures to compare measurements from gross morphology as well as ultrasound images. So let's get started. Here we go. So a total of 48 um, adult Nile tilapia were used of the gift strain. Um, 24 females and 24 males were used in this study. All of the fish were pit tagged. 
the PIT tag number was used in a reference point um, in order to organize the ultrasound images. Ultrasound examinations were conducted directly in the holding tank and in a basket. Um, the ultrasound machine that was used was the IBEX EVO2 scanner. This uh, machine has a linear probe with a freeze knob, uh, which is really nice that allows for independent examinations. Um, and the linear probe is a range from 16 to 14 megahertz. And each examination was timed from uh, start to finish. So in this study, there's three distinct landmarks that were used. These were used for orientation and interpretation and to verify the echogenicity from each landmark. So the first landmark, landmark one, the probe was placed directly underneath the pectoral fin. This gave a visual of the gallbladder. Landmark two, the probe was placed above the urogenital opening. This gave presence of the reproductive gonads. And landmark three, probe was placed anterior uh, to the caudal peduncle and just above the anal fin, and this gave a view of the muscle structure. All examinations were conducted on the right side of the fish. Okay, so to develop fish handling procedures, the first group of fish was used, totaling 16 fish. They're placed in three hand in, handling positions at all of the three landmarks. So the first Handling position being ventral recumbency. This is in an upright swimming position. The second being lateral recumbency. This is placing the fish on its side. And then the third uh, fish handling position being dorsal recumbency, which is the fish being placed upside down. So after the selected fish handling position was done, a second group was examined, and they were examined with the selected fish handling position at all five, five frequencies, 6, 8, 10, 12, and 14 megahertz. These frequent, certain frequencies were eliminated, and then the selected frequencies were used to evaluate primary control setting, depth, and focus at all landmarks. Gain was set at automatic. This was a feature that was available on the IBEX EVO machine, making it uh, really nice to not have to make those adjustments. The last group was examined with the final examination, or the yeah, with final examinations with the optimized control settings. Um, and these ultrasound images were used to compare digital frozen cross sections, which leads us into the frozen cross section process. Um, so after these final examinations, uh, these fish were euthanized. They were placed into a ice slushy bath for about an hour. This allows them to retain rigor mortis and keeps their body uh, nice and uniform. These fish were then hung, hung upright in a freezer at negative eight degrees Celsius for 24 hours and then were cut with a bandsaw at each landmark. Each of the cross sections were photographed. Um, and with this process, the camera was set at a height of 11 inches. This allowed for consistency as well as the aperture and the resolution of the camera was set the same. Um, the lighting, the only lighting in the room, the lights were turned off and the only lighting was reflected from the uh, coffee stand and a caliper was placed next to the frozen cross section as a reference point to be able to calibrate these images to receive measurements, which leads into our measurements. So measurements were made through image J um, and there's a set scale for each type of uh, image. So ultrasound images, a scale of 10 millimeters uh, per pixel was set at a calibration of 120 pixels. And then for digital images, a scale of 10 millimeters was set at a calibration of 170 pixels. Okay, so for measurements, for landmark one of the gallbladder, only one measurement was taken, the diameter of the gallbladder. That was taken at four points on the ultrasound image and was also taken on the frozen cross section. The average was taken from all these four points. For landmark two of the ovary, 
the distance between the skin and the ovary periphery was taken. Um, the measure uh, measurements from the ovary girth was also taken and oocyte diameter. And this was taken on uh, ultrasound images as well as frozen cross-section. For landmark three, two measurements were taken, the diameter of the vertebra and the muscle girth. So for analyzing, for the fish handling procedures, a one-way ANOVA was used to determine if there is a significant difference between examination time amongst the three fish handling positions. And then a two-way ANOVA was conducted to, to, to determine if landmark placement interacted with fish handling position. For the imaging procedures, uh, images were analyzed based off of basic ultrasound principles, along with combined uh, literature and uh, combined literature on ultrasound image optimization. Uh, interpretation was based off of a systematic approach developed by Novello uh, 2014. And the measurements were taken were uh, statistically analyzed through T-tests with great samples using our studio. <laughs> That leads us into our results. <laughs> so the selected fish handling <laughs> position was ventral recumbency with the fish fully submerged without the use of anesthetics and conducted with the probe on a transverse plane. This position allowed for consistent and clear images as well as identifiable, um, identify the organ of interest was identifiable in each landmark. There is a significant reduced time when compared with uh, dorsal recumbency and lateral recumbency and averaging 17 to 35 seconds less than those positions. Average examination time for the fish handling position was also um, was not significantly affected by any of the three landmarks. So now looking into our frequencies, what was eliminated? So six, megahertz, our lowest frequency, and 14 megahertz were both eliminated. And these, this was because on for all three landmarks, there was loss of definition and clarity within the images. So we're going to go ahead and cut those out. Um, for landmark one of the gallbladder, eight megahertz was selected. This was the most fitted uh, settings for the most fitted fitted frequency for the gallbladder. And then at landmark two, uh, 10 <laughs> megahertz was selected for viewing the ovary. And then for the muscle, 12 megahertz was selected for viewing the muscle structure. So looking at depth, we're gonna break them down in pieces. Landmark one, at a depth of 3.5 centimeters, was insufficient for viewing the gallbladder. Uh, there's a lack of clarity and definition, especially in the anechoic echogenicity of the gallbladder. Um, and in larger fish, the gallbladder also exceeded the distance field of view. So a depth of six centimeters allows for full visualization of the gallbladder. Um, however, there is echogenic space. So it was re recommended to put the depth at five uh, centimeters, um, or yes, recommended to put the depth at five centimeters. And based on ultrasound principles, it is stated to set a minimum, but still be deeper than the structure of interest with the target structure and with the targeted structure in the center of the image. So looking at landmark two of the ovary, a depth of three centimeters was also not optimal for viewing the ovary. Um, you lose the lining on the near field of view and you lose um, definition in the oocytes over on the left side of the page or the left side of the image. But a depth of six centimeters was optimal. However, again, a lot of excessive space in the distance field of view deters attention from the actual organ of interest. So. It was recommended to lower the depth to 4.5 centimeters. Now looking at the muscle structure, so at a depth of two centimeters, we can see here clearly like there is loss of visibility of the second half of the muscle, but at a depth of four centimeters, you've got full visualization of the muscle. However, the focus is 
the focus place at three centimeters, you lose a lot of this visibility of the top. So therefore, it was recommended that place the focus at two centimeters in the center. And basic ultrasound principles do state to place it at the organ of interest or just below the organ of interest. And in this case, it is below the organ of interest. However, that didn't work out for the muscle. So placing it at about two centimeters um, was optimal for viewing the muscle. Okay, so now some final results with the optimized settings. So schematic illustrations were developed for landmark one of the gallbladder. We have, we have a clear uh, representation of our fish handling position. The fish is in ventral recumbency with the probe being placed at a transverse plane, showing the ultrasound image associated with the probe placement, as well the, as the cross section showing representation of where these uh, ultrasound waves are penetrating. And then here's another really good example to be able to visualize this. And these aid in orientation as well as interpretation that allow users to really look at this and understand what are we looking at. The gallbladder was also a clear representation of an echogenicity of anechoic. So the gallbladder is completely filled um, with fluid. And so therefore that echogenicity will appear black. Um, frequency of eight megahertz was found optimal for the gallbladder at a depth of five centimeters and a focus of two centimeters. For the measurements for the gallbladder, there was no significant difference between digital images of the frozen cross section and ultrasound images. Looking at landmark two of the ovary, so again, another schematic illustration representing orientation and interpretation um, with our fish handling position and the probe placement um, and allowing representation of how those waves are penetrating in and how far they are. Um, and then again, another example, the optimal settings to view the ovary were at a frequency of 10 megahertz, a depth of 4.5 centimeters and a focus of two centimeters. And the ovary was a clear represent, representation of hyperechoic and anechoic fluid. Um, and the tissues were, you know, the ovary is filled with fats and soft tissues surrounded by ovarian fluid. The eggs are surrounded by ovarian fluid, which come out in anechoic and anechoic. Looking at the measurements, so ovary girth, there is no significant difference between ovary girth. Um, however, there was a significant difference between the distance from the ovary periphery to the skin and a significant difference in oocyte diameter. So moving on to the last, or oh, sorry, testes. <laughs> can't forget about the testes. I forget about the testes uh, because they're difficult to locate. Um, so in a frozen cross-section, measurements were made to be able to replicate those exact measurements onto an ultrasound image to try to pinpoint where exactly the testes were. The testes are very small um, and it was recognized to be circled the presumed um, location based off of the measurements was about right there. Um, however, there's no distinct differences in echogenicity with the surrounding tissues. So it's difficult um, to really see the testes. Now, finally, landmark three of the muscle. Um, so again, a schematic illustration was developed on the fish placement on your associated ultrasound image and a representation of what exactly is being viewed using a frozen cross-section. Um, a frequency of 12 megahertz was optimal at a depth of four and a focus of two centimeters. Uh, the muscle was a, a great example of hypoechoic um, echogenicity is the bone um, appears white, but um, hemal arch and the vertebra is very defined, um, as well as the myoceptors, which are much denser tissues. So they'll appear brighter on the skin. So the results for the mm -hmm. measurements for landmark three, there was no significant difference um, in the vertebra diameter but there was a significant difference between muscle thickness. 
So now let's discuss. <laughs> um, so this research, uh, conclu concluding thoughts, this research demonstrates the development of a systematic approach for the use of ultrasound imaging on Nile tilapia. This consists of developing fish handling procedures and followed by development of ultrasound imaging procedures and then utilizing frozen cross-section to aid with image orientation and interpretation, allowing for users that are experienced or non-experienced to be able to figure out what are we looking at. Ventral recumbency was selected as the most optimal uh, position to place the fish, generating uh, examinations to take less than 30 seconds once fish handling and ultrasound imaging procedures were uh, developed. This position also allowed for consistent and uh, clarified images that really showed and identified the organ of interest for each landmark. Landmarks in this study were chosen because they reflect the differences in the echogenicity. So the gallbladder is a clear representation of your fluid, which will appear anechoic, which appears black. The bone, the muscle section in landmark three, is a clear representation of that hypoechoic um, echogenicity that appears bright white. And then tissue is a clear representation of your hyperechoic um, uh, echogenicity that appears in the shade of gray. So in this study, the ovaries were really defined, uh, but the testes were not. So further research should be conducted to identify the testes, but it can be presumed that if you were to do an examination on an adult Nile, sexually mature Nile tilapia, that there's no presence of an ovary, then it must be a male. So looking further into it, the variability between the measurements at certain landmarks, it could be presumed that Precision may need to be made on the cuts from the bandsaw and that the freezing process influenced the measurements. Um, and then in the case of the ovary, the pressure from the probe could have affected these measurements as well. There's several other studies who have conducted, uh, looked at the differences between ultrasound measurements and the physical <laughs> measurements. McGarvey on Burbot Loda. Loda uh, found that there was 20%, 21% difference for ovarian diameter. And with that, they found that uh, the pressure exerted from the probe uh, needed to be accounted for, and that was the reason for their differences. But although, although there was variability in the measurements, these aid in these frozen cross sections really aid in image interpretation, really allow the user to determine, you know visualize what we're seeing in the ultrasound image. All right, the fun <laughs> continues. <laughs> this is just study one. The fun continues. Um, so we're gonna go further into it. But now that we've developed fish handling and ultrasound scanning imaging procedures, um, can we monitor and assess uh, ovarian development? So study two, ultrasound imaging of the ovarian development in adult tilapia. Uh, so the objectives were to obtain ultrasound images of the ovarian development in food stock fish, to evaluate ovarian development based on a classification that was created through accumulation of our histological images we received from our tilapia, and then uh, to characterize these ultrasound images based off of this classification that was created um, of the ovarian development. Okay, so started with spawning our fish. We first selected our brood stock. This was done through external morphological features. Uh, so males, you know, will have the presence of sperm uh, milt if when stripped, and they will also have a pointy papilla in the tilapia with Females, the typical swollen abdomen and enlarged uh, reddish vent. Uh, manually stripping was also used to, ver to verify if the oocytes were present. Um, all the fish were pit tagged. This was a way to organize the images and associate them with certain fish. Okay, so the spawning, so 36 nile tilapia were placed to spawn. Uh, the spawning intervals lasted for 21 days each, and there was a total of three full spawning intervals. Um, the spawning ratio was at three females to one male. 
So nine females and three males were placed into the first three spawning tanks. And then the fourth spawning tank was saved for females that were found with eggs. And this was used as an indicator to monitor the ovarian development and begin ultrasound examinations. The photo period was at 12 hours light, 12 hours dark, and then at a temperature of a uh, consistent temperature of 28 degrees Celsius. Okay, so for obtaining ultrasound images, the images were conducted using the developed handling and ultrasound imaging procedures with the optimal control settings that were developed from the first setting or the first study. Uh, Fish were checked every three days for eggs to identify females that were spent. Um, if the female was found with eggs from, in her mouth, she was separated, recorded as day zero, and were was and was initiation of beginning monitoring ovarian development using ultrasound imaging. Ten randomly selected females were examined for three weeks for every, every three days. This was to build up. A uh, characteristics um, and build up images and accumulate a bundle of images. So the spent females, the females that were identified as spent, along with the 10 selected females, were all euthanized, and then ultrasound examinations were conducted. An incision was made at the corresponding probe placement so that Jeffrey knew exactly where we were. <laughs> dissecting the fish, uh, the right ovary was removed and then placed in 10% non buffer formalin, was sent out to the histology lab at Ohio State University, where they followed standard protocols and send us all the goodies. So to analyze the histology images, a criteria, histological criteria had to be developed. And this was based off of the literature for Nile Fallopia ovarian development. It was also done utilizing the uh, histology that we received. So the histological developmental stages that were used in this study were phase one, immature. So presence of ogonia or primary oocyte will be present in this oocyte um, developmental stage. Phase two is maturing. So presence of chromatonucleolar, perinucleo Olar, cortical alveolar, and vitellogenesis will be present in a maturing oocyte. And then mature, um, you've got presence of the germical vesicle migration and germical vesicle breakdown. And then regression, which is the last phase, this is high presence of atretic and post ovular follicle. Uh, post ovular follicle this is typically done when a fish is at spent, she's already spawned. So this is the uh, histological criteria uh, that was developed. This was developed um, with accumulation of the histology images to identify specific stages to be able to identify where those fish were at and how to break it down. Um, uh, the only one that was taken from the literature in terms of like the photo was ogonia. Um, none of the females had presence of ogonia. Um, so the stage was uh, taken from literature and we weren't able to use one that was from one of our fish. So for ultrasound images, looking into the results, a total of 90 images were collected from the selected, from the selected 10 females. And 27 images were collected from the spent females. There's only two females that were, um, that actually had eggs and were uh, categorized as spent. Um, but those were used to characterize ovarian development using ultrasound imaging. These fish had spawning intervals that averaged 15 days per interval, or per, yes, per interval, and an egg clutch size that averaged about 1,500 eggs per female. Um, and the ovarian development, developmental changes were noticeable um, with these fish. One fish in particular, uh, this was fish, fish 262. Um, she was the main, she was my main girl who always kept giving me eggs. Um, and she, on day zero, she was found with eggs from her mouth. And she was uh, stated as spent in a regression, regressing period. So in her ovary, it's, it's smaller and flaccid, but it's got large remnant oocytes in here. It's surrounded by um, 
ovarian fluid. By day three, she's a lot more built. You can start to see that there's oocytes present in here. And then by day six, the echogenicity of the image is much more contrasted. And she's filled with a lot more fattier oocytes that are developing and maturing. And by day nine, she's completely filled and oocytes are actually even larger. And the presence of the intestines, which is the eye, that's the presence of the intestines, that's the intestines, starts to kind of reduce. And then by day 12, it's actually completely gone. She's completely covered. Um, she's completely filled. And the distance from the ovary periphery to the skin has uh, been shortened. So she's filling up. Um, and then within three days of day 12, she was found with eggs again in her mouth. And these images share some characteristics such as uh, enlarged oocytes, large remnant oocytes, um, and ovarian fluid. So for the histology, none of these females had presence of immature oocytes with ogonia. Um, there wasn't a large presence of primary growth stages, chromatic nucleolar, perinucleolar, and cortical alveolar. Um, all the fish appeared to have ovaries with dominant presence of oocytes in maturing, mature, and regression. So looking, uh, blowing up into one of the stages, example regression, ultrasound characteristics were developed for the image and uh, were corresponded with, verified with the histology. So this female was spent in regression, in a regressing period. Her characteristics are that she's got large um, individual residual remnant oocytes surrounded by ovarian fluid uh, and a combination of hypoechoic and anechoic structures. Um, she's got a defined ovary lining um, and then with the histology to verify that, there's high presence of atresia along with post-ovulatory follicle, which are these strings. And that's just the breakdown uh, of the ovarian wall. So closing remarks, um, the use of this research utilizes histology and ultrasound images to characterize ovarian development in that ovulation. The biological indicator that fish was found with eggs was used as a point to initiate monitoring ovarian development using ultrasonography. And the changes of the ovary were noticeable by considering ovary size, oocyte shape, and oocyte size, uh, oocyte shape and size. Uh, to develop a full characteristic profile, though. Uh, that displays concrete images of all the developmental stage, including immature. We need females, future research needs to utilize females of different age classes um, and build a, a characteristic profile with those workshop images and histology. So in conclusion, some final thoughts for studies one and two. This research recognizes the use of ultrasonography in Nile floppy as a useful tool to assess the physiology and morphology of fish, develop schematic illustrations for aiding in image interpretation that allow for experience and non-experience, um, to understand ultrasound principles, and characterizes and observes the changes in ovarian development. A systematic approach was developed in this study for uh, fish handling and ultrasound scanning procedures for Nile tilapia. This was made also to be universal uh, for other fish species and be replicated. And that's why there was so much detail with the control settings so that other farmers, researchers, biologists, scientists um, can all uh, be able to replicate the research or utilize these control settings. Um, this, this research is the building block and the starting point, the backbone to future research with monitoring ovarian development, further initiating uh, sex differentiation of Nile tilapia and utilizing this technology as an assistive technique um, in broodstock management and hatchery practice. And I just want to have a megahertz of thank you, um, of course, to my committee members, especially Dr. Novello, 
uh, for your expertise in ultrasonography um, and Dr. Kamelski and Dr. Simmons, uh, Jeffrey Warner, thank you for you know keeping me sane, close friendship and lending hand. Uh, the production building, always supporting each other and making it more enjoyable. Uh, my family, uh, my mom, my dad, uh, my three brothers, Joshua, Aaron, and Abraham, for you guys' endless support and love. Um, and of course, my mentor and friend, Dr. Rafael Cuevas Uribe. I wouldn't be, um, you know, pursuing a master's if it wasn't for him. And then, of course, the grant that was funding this research. <laughs> Okay, and I will take any questions now. <laughs>